If you have your Bible, turn with me to the book of Ephesians. And that's where we're going to spend our time this morning. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7 in particular is where you can find me. Continuing in Ephesians, I want to remind you of something very important. That this book was written to what we would consider young believers in Christ. This book was written to people who haven't known Jesus their whole life. As a matter of fact, they've only been in a relationship with Jesus recently. And so, certain Christ- this, re- this was written not only to young believers, but to certain believers. Certain ones. Ones, in, particularly who, who in particular, who faithfully attended church. I don't want to undermine that. The whole of scripture, but especially the New Testament, was written to regular attenders of churches. Just like you guys. Just like us. People who regularly came to be fed, to be encouraged, to have fellowship, and in our mission statement for our church, to worship, link, learn, and serve. That's who this was written to. Believers who regularly attend. So we're thankful for that. That God wrote something specifically for us. And that's the encouragement for you and I. So this is for young believers, and it's a, it's a doctrine class for young believers, and it's rich doctrine, rich living through Ephesians. And so, this morning, we're going to see the completion. Last Sunday morning, we took a look, and what we saw was how God richly blessed us. All these blessings that God gives. And this morning, as you see in the title of my sermon, there are two people involved in giving us more blessings this week. Christ and the Spirit. Christ and the Holy Spirit. So that from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 through 14, the Trinity is completely involved in blessing believers. God did that on purpose. It's a message for you and for me. All of the parts of the Trinity are working together in unity for the believers. So it's really powerful. It's a really good thing to keep in mind that the Trinity is at work for you and for me. And so um, this morning, though, we're going to turn then to see how we've been redeemed by Christ and how we've been sealed by the Spirit. And so that's, the, that's where we're headed this morning and what I want to take a look at with you. All summer long, though, I want to start by telling you this. All summer long, this summer, we have been having backyard Bible study every other week um, at people's homes and in people's lives. And I've been a pastor here now for four years, and I have heard many of your personal salvation testimonies, namely because when you're, as a brand new pastor, area that I was interested in, to come and to sit with you or talk with you, see you at church and ask you, when did you accept Jesus as your Savior? Hopefully you and I have had that conversation. If I've never had that conversation with you, I would love to. I would love to hear your personal salvation testimony. And all this summer, we've been hearing, because we, what we did was we invited, we invited the host homes of our backyard Bible studies to share their personal salvation testimony with us. And so all summer long, we've been, we've been uh, hearing from the personal testimonies of the way God has touched lives of people at Calvary Baptist Church. The way God has moved in them. The way God has called them to salvation. And then what he's done with them since that point. And I have to tell you something that I'm really encouraged by. Is all summer long... When you're looking, you're sitting across and you're being reminded of people's testimonies, you're sitting across, I'm sitting across from people I look up to in the faith, from people who I'm encouraged by in the faith, from people that I know in the faith. But when you hear their story, there is always one common theme. I was nothing until I met Jesus. I didn't have the plans. I wasn't living the right life until I met Jesus. I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't, I didn't know the right path. I was lost and confused until I met Jesus. And those testimonies this summer, every single week, I have to work really hard to hold it together from crying because of how powerful it is. Because of how beautiful it is that people have a story where they say, I was one way, 
But then I met Jesus, and now I'm living my life a totally different way. And every testimony, whether they, whether they even realize it or not, I heard that. I heard that. And that's what we're going to take a look at this morning. This is, this is a part of the theme of this, these verses, 7 through 14 in Ephesians, is a new life. A new life. And so we want to take a look at that from this perspective. If you have your Bible, read with me. And I'm going to read verses 7 through 13 for now. In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of, the tr of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you, were be when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. This morning, the first thing we're going to see is our blessings from Christ. Our blessings from Christ. And the very first blessing from Christ that's pointed out in this passage is the one that I've titled my sermon after is that He redeemed us by paying the price. He redeemed us by paying the price. I draw your attention again to verse 6 because this kind of makes the connection to help you see that this is talking about Jesus Christ. Verse 6. To the praise of his glorious grace, talking about God, which he, God, has freely given us in the one he loves. Jesus Christ. In the one he loves. Jesus so at the end of last week's sermon, God blessing us, part of his blessing to us, was giving us Christ, the one he loves. And now this week, in verses 7 through 14, we see how Christ blesses us. So you have to start there, because verse 7, the very first words are, in him. And so in him is referring to the one God loves, Jesus Christ. If you look at verse 7 and you didn't look at the verses before that, you might think in him meant God. So it's important for me to point that out. No, in him, in him, and all of that through there where he's talking about his blood and, and what he did for us and how he, he, he did these things, that's talking about Jesus Christ. It's talking about Jesus. In him, Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. In the Roman Empire, one thing that was rampant was slavery. Slavery. A topic that whether we want to talk about it or not today, even still comes up today because of the brutal, terrible nature of what slavery is. And slavery is not over. Slavery still exists in the world today. Both physical slavery, when you think of that term, but also in the way that women are abused and children are abused. Slavery still exists. But in the Roman Empire, slavery was rampant and slavery was everywhere. Very visible. So for Paul, one option, he's, when he's addressing here, and what the theme, the thought that he's giving to them, and the theme and thought that we need to learn about is one option for slaves, however was, to get out of slavery, this. Someone could purchase that slave and then set the slave free. Someone could go to a slave 
Know the slave. Know the slave's lot in life. Know what the slave had done to be put into slavery and sometimes nothing. Know the slave's name. Know the slave's family. Know the slave's traditions. Know the slave's historical background. Know the slave's religion. Know everything about the slave because that was property. It'd be the same as you and I, what we do when we investigate a new car. There's all sorts of information out there for new cars. Mark Eisenhart is the guy for new cars. If you need a new car, well, a used new car, see Mark. He can help you, okay? But there's all sorts of information out there. I'm amazed at the stuff you can find about a vehicle and the history of a vehicle. Similar with the slave. They could find out every detail about that slave's life if they wanted to. And then purchase that person and set them free. I don't know if it hits you or not, but Jesus Christ, he knows every single detail about my life. He knows every single detail about your life. And Jesus, is, this is exactly what Jesus did for us, except with one exception laid out. And I want to show that to you from 1 Peter. 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19 says this, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. But with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Jesus Christ, he redeems us. It's the first and most important thought. He redeems us from slavery. He's going to redeem us by paying the price. But the big difference between Jesus here, when he's talking about, I will redeem you. In him we have redemption through his blood. The difference between slave traders of Paul time, Paul's time was, he didn't pay in money. He didn't pay in what the world would consider payment today or any time. Instead, what price could be paid for our sin? There was only one. His blood. What could earn us freedom? What could do that? Only one thing. I think that the hymn writer says it best when he says this. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of of Jesus. For my pardon, this I see. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this my plea. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of of Jesus. It's very exciting because what we realize is because of Jesus redeemed us by paying the price and his blood, we are no longer slaves to sin. But instead, you and I are free men and women and we owe it all to one rich blessing from Christ that he chose to redeem us by paying the price. He chose he chose to hand that down as a blessing to you. He chose to hand that down as a blessing to your grandkids. He chose to hand that down as a blessing to your neighbors. He chose to hand that down to people we know, people we serve alongside of in our communities and in our towns and in our, in our neighboring areas in the state of Michigan and people in churches today worshiping the Lord. He decided to redeem us, to buy us back from sin for his own, and he did it through the blood shed for you. The blood shed for me. And not only did he redeem us then, but the next point, he offers forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins. Verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood. 
the forgiveness of sins. Not only has the price been paid, not only was the price paid for your life, but the debt is completely forgiven. It's gone. You owe nothing to him because he forgives you. He forgives you. Sometimes as Christians, I think that uh, maybe this is just me in this room, but I have a feeling some of you will agree with me. I grow sometimes weary and depressed by the weight of my sin. I shouldn't have done that. I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I chose this rather than choosing that. I can't believe I sinned against the holy God. I can't believe. You know what? Sometimes, and you're there too, sometimes I have this guilt. I'm a pastor. I can't believe that I sinned. I can't believe I'm a Sunday school teacher. I can't believe that I sinned. You know what? I'm an example for my family. I can't believe that I did that in front of them and they saw me and it happened. You know what? I'm an example in my community where I'm at serving or in the school system where you're at. I can't believe I sinned and they saw. And then because of that, what happens is this really natural, I think, thing happens because Jesus is addressing it so much in the scripture. We feel worthless. And we feel filthy. And we feel disgusting. And sometimes you get stuck living in the weight of your sin. But do you realize Jesus knew everything about you, past, present, and future. He knew. He knows what you're doing. He knows what's happening in your life. He knows the sins. And when you ask for forgiveness from him, he forgives. The debt's canceled. It's gone. Once for all, when you accepted Jesus as your Savior, he forgave all of your sins. Past, present, future. Of course, we still repent. Lord Jesus, help me because I did wrong. He knows. He knows. He's already paid the price. This is an encouragement to keep on sinning. Because Paul talks about that too. It's not an encouragement. Well, just keep sinning then because Jesus died for you and, he, and he'll pay the penalty. No, that's not it. But what it is, it's an encouragement to you to say, I don't have to feel the weight of my sin every time. Instead, I can feel the forgiveness of my Savior. He forgives me. He redeemed me by paying the price and he offers me forgiveness of sin. You know what Jesus does with our sin? It's amazing. Psalm 103, verse 12, and Micah, verse 7, 19, say these things, and I want you to see them. What Jesus does with our sin, Psalm 103 says, our sins are as far as the east is from the west. Micah 7, 19 says, you will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. It's not good enough to Jesus to just redeem your sin. He wants to forgive your sin and he wants to cast them to the depth of the sea. According to scripture in 1 John, it says he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. It's an interesting term. Faithful and just. God is a just God, isn't he? But yet he's just to forgive. His character is one where he says, I paid for you. That sin is over. That sin is done. Jesus, in the cross, in an amazing way, he redeems you and he offers you Forgiveness. That's blessings from him. Those are amazing, miraculous blessings from the Son of God that each one of us have. 
Each one of us. And he's explaining it to the Ephesian church. Maybe they're realizing and wrapping their mind about around this for the first time. In Jesus, you have redemption through his blood. He bought you back just like a slave. Those are the terms he's using. They would have felt that. They would have understood that. Jesus bought you like he bought his own, like a slave and he set you free and he expects nothing from you in return. Because he forgave your sin. There's no debt. The debt's been canceled. It's far, far away. The next thing that we see in the scripture is that he gives wisdom and understanding to know his will. If God is so holy, if Jesus is so amazing that he forgives us, there still is a component in which we need, as Christians, to understand and know his will. Verses 8 through 9, read with me. Uh, Sorry, seven, halfway through seven. In accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in Christ. It wasn't good enough for Jesus just to save you wasn't good enough for Jesus just to pay for your sins. Jesus wants you to understand him. And Paul's explaining that to them. You know what? Jesus came to you. He saved you. He's chosen you. And once he's accepted you into his family, he's going to freely give you these things in accordance with God's grace that he gave us. He's going to give you wisdom. Wisdom. Wisdom when it comes to life and death. Wisdom when it comes to God and man. Wisdom when it comes to good versus evil. Wisdom when it comes to situations like heaven versus hell. Wisdom over eternal things. Wisdom to know about ultimate things that are final in eternity. Christ gives us wisdom in those very confusing and sometimes tricky areas of life to follow him well. He blesses us with wisdom. You know, Scripture says if you ask for wisdom, he's faithful to give it to you. He'll give it to you. Think about Solomon. What a good choice he asked the Lord. Give me wisdom. Give me wisdom that I might know what you would have for me. But wisdom is there. Wisdom is part of our outline point there. He gives wisdom, but he also gives understanding. Understanding, that word Paul is using, it it applies to very practical living. Practical everyday life. The word for understanding is phronesis, which refers to the way we think. I I mentioned it before I even started our service sermon today. How we think how our mind sees everyday issues according to the way Jesus wants us to see them. Because you see an accident like what happened yesterday and you don't see it always at first the way Jesus wants you to see that. You see the hard, you see the hurt, you see the pain, you see the suffering. You don't see it and understand it from the way Jesus would want us to. But when you put on understanding that Jesus freely gives you here, and you pair it with that wisdom to have an eternal perspective on the world, it helps us to see how our mind should process everyday issues. The best way to have wisdom and understanding is to study God's word. That's the best way. And Paul emphasizes that other places and other areas. Jesus came and he richly blesses you. These blessings are from Christ. He gives you wisdom to see things like God would see them and then understanding to live your life the way God would want you to live your life based on what you know. Based on what you see according to his word. One thing that's really hard to say And a time like this is this. 
God would have been given all the glory in Gary's situation no matter what happened. And if you believe the scripture, you believe that's true. Because he has the plans for our life. His ways are higher than our ways. And the true believer in Christ Jesus trusts in that. So you put that eternal wisdom and you apply it to the practical situation. Lord, we're thankful you preserved his life. You could have done a, a, any number of things. We really are, are thankful for the way you've worked in this one. That's the wisdom and understanding. That's because it comes from his will, the underlying point. It's not our plans. It's not what we want. It's not what we would have had to happen. It's not what we think should happen. It comes when we start to tune in to God's plan. What does God want in this situation? What is he doing? And do I trust his plan for me? Do I trust him? Do I trust that plan for me? He gives it to us. This is a blessing from Christ. He offers us redemption. He offers us forgiveness of sin. He offers you the opportunity to know and understand his will. It's an amazing gift. And especially in a church like Ephesus, where this is, this is one of their first pieces of helpful biblical literature to study, they need that encouragement. They needed it. Again, they're young believers. They're just trying to figure out what it means to follow Jesus. And Paul comes along and he says, you know what? Take a burden off your back because after Jesus saves you and paid the price on the cross through his blood for you and gave you forgiveness of sins, he, he'll give you the wisdom and understanding to follow his will. He will. It's a blessing from Christ that he gives. The next thing we see in verse 10 is that he unifies us. He unifies his people. Verses 7 through 8 and 9 um, showed us all that things, all the things we needed to do to understand and, and know his will, but then his will and his plan and his purposes, it can unify believers. Verse 10. To be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment. To bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. You know, really the outline point should include verses 8 and 9 too because it's, part, it's all a part of it. It's all a part of that wisdom and understanding. We're starting to understand his will. And through that, he brings unity to Christians. Through understanding, he gives us the ability to know what he's doing. In verse 9, it says, He made known to us the mystery of his will. The word mystery there has nothing to do with something scary or hidden or, or anything like that. The word mystery there is referring to a sacred Secret, something that was once hidden, but is now revealed to all God's people. See, Paul is still originally a Jew. And they had very limited understanding of what the Messiah was going to do. They did know. They did believe he was coming. They did know he was prophesied. They did know Jesus was going to come one day. But they had very little understanding of what he would do. But Paul is telling them here, now he has made known to us the mystery. He gave us a sacred secret of his will. What was the sacred secret? The sacred secret is that he plans in verse 10 to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. He has a plan for complete unity. And even now, as he works to fulfill that plan, he is giving unity to the believers. See, 
what's going to be, it says in verse 10, the first half, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment. That's talking about the end. When the time reaches their fulfillment. When your time reaches its fulfillment, at the dentist's office, you stand up and you leave. When your time reaches your fulfillment, at the football game, you get up and you go because the game's done. It's reached its full fulfillment. It's done. It's over. So Christ is referring, when this happens, you'll know. When I ultimately bring unity to everything on heaven and on earth, it's because it's going to be in the end. And I will bring unity. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. No matter where they go, heaven or hell, every knee will bow to Jesus. Every tongue will confess and will be brought into complete unity. Heaven and her earth brought in to unity. And it's not just as his plan unfolds. See, the time is reaching their fulfillment. It's still moving towards, rather than using the term reaching, but moving towards fulfillment. So as things are working towards that, Christ is still doing something amazing. He is still bringing unity in heaven and earth. And the best way he does that is through his bride, the church. It's what he does. That's how he acts. He's given us these blessings and he uses the church to start and help people see what it will be like when all heaven and all earth is unified. Then he makes us to the praise of his glory. Verses 11 through 13. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of when your salvation, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal. Our chosen and predestined status that we talked about last week is brought back up in these verses. And not only our chosen and predestined status, but Paul is referring to the Jewish believers here too. The Jewish Christians. And he's referring to them by using the terms, we who were first to put our hope in Christ in verse 12. See that? In order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ. He's talking about Jewish believe, Jew, Jews. They were the first to put their hope in Christ because they believed in the coming Messiah. Ephesians is a, a church that's mostly full of Gentiles. They weren't a part of that original group. They weren't a part of the Jews who believed in Jesus, the coming Messiah. And a lot of the Jews rejected Jesus. As a matter of fact, most of them rejected but there are some, and Paul is, Paul is talking to them, there are some Jewish believers in that congregation, and he's giving them encouragement. He says, you know what? We were the first to put our hope in this Jesus, and even now, it's that Jesus that you put your hope in. It's the same Jesus. And you were the first. You were first part of that group to put your hope in Jesus. He gives us that background. But it's not just the Jewish believers. Verse 13 says, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Gentile believers. People who aren't Jewish. That'd be me. I don't think I have any Jewish family in my background. I've said it before and my dad never called me. I said it one time preaching similar that I didn't think I had any uh, Jewish family heritage and my dad never called me to correct me. I said, dad, correct me if I'm wrong. You know, give me a call this week because he always listens to my sermons. Thanks, dad. Love you. Look into the camera. He's up there. <laughs> I don't have any Jewish background. I don't know about you. So I wasn't the first that Paul is mentioning here, but I was a part. 
I am a part of verse 13, and so are you. You also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. You have to believe in Jesus for salvation. If you've never done that, you're not included. But if you've done that, which many of us in this room have, you're included. You're included in all of this blessing that we can put our hope in Jesus Christ. And what's the point? That's the point. It's stuck in there in verse 12. In the last part. We who are the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. I think you remember this from last week, but last week we talked about how God created us for the praise of his glory. And Jesus, likewise, saved us. He saved Jewish believers. He saves Gentile believers. Why? For the praise of his glory. He makes us a part of, not that he has to, but he makes us a part of his trophy case in heaven. They are mine. That's a follower of me. They're they're to the praise of my glory. They bring me glory through the way they live their life. That's what they're there for. They're all brought together. Jew and Gentile. That was a big theme for that early church. It's a big theme in the Bible, in the New Testament. You who've been through sermons for a long time have known this. That's a big theme. They're brought together. He's trying to unify the church even still. You are one team, all for one purpose. The praise of God's glory. There's a lot of different people in this room with a lot of different backgrounds. And you've come from different areas. You've come from different upbringings, different things. But one common theme that we all have is that if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, he puts us together as a team for his glory. For his glory. That's what he wants. That's what he wants with our church family. It's to use us to the praise of his glory. And so the big overarching theme that I see, and I think you see it with me, when you look at this first section of blessings from Christ, is this. I've been given a new life thanks to Christ. Me? I've been given new life thanks to Christ? And you wrestle with that question. I've been given new life thanks to Christ? And those who have placed their faith in Jesus, the answer is yes. A complete and total yes. You've been given a new family. You've been given a new name, a new inheritance, a new life. You can forget the things in the past. And we talk about testimonies many of you have and many of you want to. Let go of the things in the past and embrace your new life thanks to Christ. What he's done for you is amazing. And you can embrace that new life in Christ. And then it leaves us with just a few verses on the Holy Spirit. But just because there are only a few about the Holy Spirit doesn't mean they're any less important. And we want to look at them and know them that these blessings too are coming from the Holy Spirit. And so it says in verse 13... towards the middle. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. It's already up there, but the point remains. He has sealed us. The Holy Spirit has sealed us. The Holy Spirit gets a part of the blessing to us. You are so valuable to God that God had to create and find a way to keep you for his own. So the moment of your salvation, the moment of the salvation of the Ephesian believers, the moment you accepted him as Savior, you were immediately sealed by the Holy Spirit. And the ancient world, a seal, did this. 
it indicated authenticity. It showed approval. It gave a certificate of genuineness. It indicated ownership and could also be used as a pledge for protection. Let me read that again and apply it to us. The Holy Spirit does this for you. He, I, he authenticates that you belong to God. He gives approval to God in your life, that connection and approval. He gives a certificate of genuineness that you genuinely belong to the Lord. It, the Holy Spirit indicates who owns you. An indication of ownership. I belong to God. And the Holy Spirit inside of you is a pledge for your protection. That God will never abandon you. He will never forsake you. He will never leave you. Because of the next point. Because he's a deposited guarantee in your life. The Holy Spirit is our deposit. God deposited the Holy Spirit in us as a proof and guarantee that we belong to him. The Holy Spirit is like a down payment that guarantees us our eternal place in heaven. The Holy Spirit lives in you, guaranteeing your place in heaven. Look at this question I ask then. If that's true, if the Holy Spirit, this teaching Paul is giving us is true, then this is the question we have to ask. A piece of heaven is in me? This is something I want to hang on to. Studying God's word is important. I never thought about it this way, and I will remember this forever because I have a two-year-old who is very curious. And I'm assuming that pretty soon one day when he hears dad talking about heaven a lot, he's going to ask, what is heaven? And then pretty soon, it won't be long before he'll ask the question, where is heaven? You know, it's interesting. We look up to the sky and think heaven must be there. Heaven's right here. And heaven is right there and right there and right there and right there and right there. A piece of heaven is inside of you. The promised Holy Spirit. And how differently we might act if we truly believed that heaven was inside of me. How differently we might think if not only just a small piece of heaven, but you know what? The God of heaven dwells inside of you. Making you a seal, giving you a deposit, calling you his own, calling you his child. And might we then remember and be challenged. Live like a piece of heaven is in you. Because it is. Because it is. And that's what, that's what Paul is pointing to. He says, you know what? There's a piece of Holy, the Holy Spirit inside of you. It's, it's sealing you. It's keeping you. It's showing that you're God's possession. And why does the Holy Spirit do it? Why does the Holy Spirit come to be a seal for you? The last sentence, the last part of verse 14, to the praise of his glory. God blesses us to the praise of his glory. Jesus blessed us to the praise of his glory. And the Holy Spirit blesses us to the praise of his glory. So that way you and I would bring God glory. And this morning I want you to think about this. We are richly blessed by God because God, Jesus' blood paid the price to give us a new life. And the Holy Spirit is a piece of heaven sealed in us, guaranteeing our salvation. What do you do with a list of items like that? What do you do with a list of blessings like that? What do you do when you remember that Jesus freed you from sin and gave you a new life? There's only one thing you can do, there's only one answer. You use your new life for him. You use what he's given you to the praise of his glory. Bow in a word of prayer with me. Father, we are grateful for you. We're grateful for the way you have blessed us through Christ Jesus. You redeemed us through Christ. And you sealed us with the Holy Spirit. And even now, God is living. You, God, are living and active in this room. You're a part of our lives. 
Heaven lives in us. Help us to remember to follow and to trust you all the days of our life and use our new life for you. It's in Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen.